speakers who are joining us here uh, in the Senate and also those who are joining us on Starleaf and just advise members <coughs> that they are welcome to use the mobile devices as long as they are in airplane mode and all devices are muted. This includes members' tablet devices and they can connect to the Assembly Wi-Fi. We are obliged to declare any financial or other relevant interests which might reasonably be thought by others to influence uh, our approach to the matter under consideration. And any member uh, who may have an interest to declare in relation to today's business should do so now or when the particular matter arises in the meeting. Sure, just uh, maybe sort of belt and braces in that regard, but just in terms of item seven, I suppose still registered as a non-practicing member of the okay. Northern Iron Bar. Okay, thank okay. you, Peter, for Agreed. that. Uh, just to get your agreement that the oral evidence session on the Justice Sexual Offences and Trafficking and Victims Bill uh, to be reported by Hansard. Agreed. Uh, item one, we have the apologies. We have an apology from the Deputy Chair, Sinead Ennis, Doug Beatty and Emma Rogan. And just to advise members that uh, Gemma and Rachel and uh, Sinead are joining us by Starleaf. Uh, Robin has said that he'll be a few minutes late. In regards to those who have delegated their authority to vote on, behalf, on their behalf, provided for by Standing Order 1156, the Deputy Chair, uh, Sinead and Emma, have delegated their votes to Gemma. Agenda item two, the draft minutes of the meeting held on the 25th of November are at pages 5 to 13 of today's meeting pipe. And are you content that these minutes are a true reflection of the proceedings of the meeting held on the 25th of November? Agreed. Agreed. Uh, agenda item three, uh, matters arising. Uh, item one, the Department of Justice have provided the text of the amendments to widen the existing abuse of position of trust provisions and for the abolition of the rough sex of de defence in the Justice Sexual Offences and Trafficking Victims Bill. The relevant correspondence can be found at pages 15 to 21 of today's pack. The Department has indicated that its amendment will extend the current scope of abuse of position of trust to include certain activities carried out in sports and faith settings. A delegated power is also proposed which will enable additional settings to be included by way of secondary legislation when such legal intervention is considered necessary in the future. In respect of the rough sex defence, the Department has advised that its amendment uh, will address perceived issues of clarity and consistency regarding the application of the existing case law position. The Department has indicated that the drafting of the two uh, remaining amendments is at advanced stage and they will be shared with the committee as soon as possible. And uh, Just to note the amendments and advise that the text of the abuse of position of trust amendments will be forwarded to the NSPCC and Bernardo's uh, for further comment as agreed at our meeting on the 11th of November. And if members, uh, just to inform members that the letter and the text of the amendments will be added to the electronic bill folder on committee web pages and a link will be tweeted to highlight that that is available. Uh, Gemma? Yeah, thanks, Chair. Can I just check, um, you know, given the DOJ have said they've worked closely with the NSPCC and other key stakeholders, why has the abuse of trust amendment only been limited to sports and faith settings and not extracurricular activities and hobbies? Is it a secondary legislation issue or what's the problem or can we ask them? Yes, we can ask them for clarity, but yes, I, I, may, I think that's what they're saying that they would include it by way of secondary legislation, which is uh, in terms of the legal intervention when they s consider necessary. Now, I think we should seek clarity from the department in regards to that. Content? Sure. Yeah, just, uh, Peter? Yeah, on a similar, similar point to Gemma's in relation to that. I mean, I'm just wondering, and maybe we can get a bit of clarification on, in terms of from a drafting point of view, um, it seems to be the approach they've taken is they've, they've initially included, obviously, the faith-based um, and the sporting side of things, and basically saying we will add to this as necessary type of thing. But it does strike me that potentially that could be a little bit piecemeal then, that we're saying problems are arisen in, in yep. subject X, Y, and Z, we're adding X, Y, and Z, as opposed, I would have thought if the construction of the way it was drafted was, broadly speaking, covering all the positions of, you know, just whether it's extracurricular or whatever, the, the phraseology, 
would be, uh, I'm just wondering a little bit that if it's essentially adding as necessary, there's, a, there's going to be a slight degree of danger of a catch-up of, yeah. um, yes, here's such and such has emerged in this type of institution, we're now going to add that after the event as opposed to, yeah. and it, it just strikes me as potentially, be something, maybe there's a very good legal reason for that, but I think again, if, if we can just clarify as to why they've taken that particular approach. Yes, um, and, and what really is the difference between including it in, this, uh, um, uh, in an amendment as opposed to using a delegated power? Yeah. You know, why do they see that that's necessary? Yeah. Uh, Rachel? Thank you, Chair. And just I suppose like everybody else, I'm a bit um, you know, disappointed in a way about seeing the, 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 this is not what the children's sector had called for um, and had asked us to consider. Um, but I'm sure we can uh, get that clarification from the department about why it has been limited. Um, I think if it possible, could we send this all to the children's commissioner's office as this was raised as an issue with them as well, as well as NSPCC and Bernardo's. And also then on the rough sex defence, uh, we had questioned um, a number of um, people that had been in front of us last week, uh, Chair, on the, the rough sex defence and they hadn't been um, consulted, you know, as much as, as and I hadn't really had a lot of input into the drafting of this amendment. And there had been concerns, and I, I know that Women's Aid will be raising this as well with the R. V. Brown case, uh, and whether or not this um, this amendment actually addresses those concerns. Perhaps we could get some clarification from the department on that. Okay, agreed. Uh, Sinead. Sorry, no, Chair, I won't go over. The points have been well made by colleagues, but yes, the Children's Commissioner was the point I want to raise. And also, I, just to follow the logic, because I can't see that retrospective convictions could be put in place if we didn't have a, a broader catch. So I don't understand the logic. appreciate that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, members, item two, the Committee Forward Work Programme for December 2021. Uh, and just to note the updated work programme and... Uh, also, the correspondence from the department confirming the position on a number of work items that can be found at pages 22 to 27 of today's pack. Item three, the Law Commission, a summary of consultation paper on the intimate image abuse. Uh, during the oral evidence session with Victims Support NI on the Justice Bill uh, last week, reference was made to the Law Commission's consultation on the intimate image abuse, and the committee agreed that a copy of the report should be circulated to all committee members. A summary of the consultation paper can be found at pages 28 to 57 of the meeting pack and will also be included in the electronic bill folder. The full consultation paper is available on the Law Commission's website and members can contact the committee office for the link to the document if that is required. Item 4, Legislative Consent Motion for the Police Crime Sentencing and Courts Bill. You'll find this at pages 3 to 55 of the table pack for today's meeting. At our meeting on the 18th of November, the committee considered information from the department on the consultation of the draft code of practice for the provisions of the police crime sentencing and courts bill on the extraction of data from the mobile devices. This provision has been excluded from the legislative consent motion for the bill, which was agreed by the Assembly on the 23rd of November, and the committee had been advised that the Minister of Justice may bring the issue back to the Executive when the Code of Practice was drafted and consulted on. The Minister has now written, noting that the Information Commissioner's Office report on mobile phone data extraction by police in Northern Ireland, which was published in June, recommends that the framework on data extraction should be strengthened to ensure clarity for victims witnesses and offenders, to address the inconsistencies between police forces and to clarify the lawful basis for such extraction. The Minister believes this clarity strengthens, strengthens the case for placing the matter on a statute footing and notes that the Attorney-General and the Human Rights Commission are continuing to be engaged on the draft code of practice. The Right Hon. Kit Malthouse MP, Minister of State for Crime and Policing in the Home Office, has confirmed that a public consultation in the Code of Practice of, for these powers will be undertaken after the Bill has received royal assent, and the provisions will not be commenced until that has been completed. Commencement may also happen in different jurisdictions on different days, so Northern Ireland is not bound by the UK-wide commencement. Given the time constraints, the Minister has written to the Executive and the Committee in parallel, and is requesting that the Committee's views on 
proceeding with an LCM on the basis that the provisions will extend to Northern Ireland but not be commenced until the code of practice has been finalised. And if agreement is reached to proceed with the LCM, the Minister will write to Kate Malthouse MP confirming that the provisions as they relate to Northern Ireland should not be commenced without the agreement of the Assembly. And just to seek the views of the committee on whether you are content in principle to support the LCM uh, for the provisions in the Police Crime Sentencing and Courts Bill relating to the extraction of the data from the electronic devices to extend to Northern Ireland, but not to be commenced until such times as the code has been finally subject to the executive agreement to the LCM, or if there is any other information that we seek clarity on. Shanae. Thank you, Chair. And I don't want to, um, I suppose, put down the, the role of this committee in any way, but I'm not sure that seeking our view in parallel with the executive is necessarily, you know, I'm always hesitant um, when it comes to LCMs generally. And actually through the procedures committee, we're doing quite a piece of work on parts, you know, in terms of the timing and the lack of transparency sometimes. But I do think this is a new twist when we start to have committees making decisions parallel to the executive. I'm not sure I'm really comfortable with that. And I, th I think uh, for that, Sinead, and, and I would share your, your comments in relation to that, we can make our decision irrespective of what may uh, be the decision of the executive. I think on this one, uh, to try and be fair to uh, the minister, it may be more a timing issue uh, a timing issue in relation to the progress of the bill in the House of Commons, but also obviously in regards to our own circumstances uh, as the, the clerk is ticking down uh, closer to, uh, to Perda. But I think the points are well made, but we can make our decision and sub subject to uh, that being conveyed to us. I really, the reason why we put that in was for information so that members knew, know that this is coming probably at us over the next few weeks. I appreciate that, okay. and they're fair points, Chair. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Uh, that then brings us members to item four, which is the oral evidence session with the Women's Aid Federation. You'll find uh, the uh, relevant uh, papers in regards to this session at pages 162 to 173 of the meeting pack. And uh, we'll wait until our colleagues get seated. And can I welcome to the committee this afternoon Sonia McMullen, the Regional Services Manager, and Karen Devlin, the representatives uh, of Women's Aid Federation in Northern Ireland. And just to advise uh, our colleagues that the session will be reported by Hansard and that the transcript will be published on the committee's uh, web page. Can I just uh, welcome you both to the committee this afternoon? and invite Sonia to briefly outline the specific if issues in relation to the revisions of the bill the Women's Aid wish to draw to the attention of the committee, and then for members to indicate uh, as there will be questions, and I will endeavour to work our way through that. Thank you. You're very welcome. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for the opportunity to address you today, Chair, and other committee members. As you've said, um, I'm Sonia McMullen, and this is my colleague, Karen Devlin. And today we'll be speaking on behalf of the... Sorry, is that all right? Because you said with the sound, is it OK? We'll be speaking on behalf of the eight local women's aid groups across Northern Ireland, and of course the women whose voices we hope to portray within the session. We also would like to take the opportunity to thank the members of the committee, both past and present, and acknowledge all of the considerable work that's been undertaken in the last few years, especially with the introduction of the Domestic Abuse and Civil Proceedings Act, which we do hope will be operational in February next year. It's been a busy time for all of us. Um, there's so many other pieces of legislation coming forward, including the stocking bill, stocking protection orders and notices, introduction of non-fatal strangulation, domestic abuse protection orders and notices, and of course, everything that's included within this justice bill as well. So it's important to acknowledge the work and thank you. We've listened to so many voices of women within the consultation period, and as have you, and you know, that has to be noted that so many women have come back to us and they've really appreciated the time that the committee has taken to listen to them. And last week we launched our Hear Her Voice project outcomes. It was a project that 
took part. There was over 90 women involved in the project, many of which shared their stories and the journey through the criminal justice system as to why I, I've raised it. And Karen has today. We have some of the books with the, the stories within them um, for you all and happy to share with the committee members that aren't here today some electronic copies as well. But through that, it really shows the challenges that they face going through the criminal justice system. You know, the right legislation wasn't here in some of the places and the right pathways for victims and survivors of domestic and sexual abuse. So in the last year, Women's Aid have supported just over 6,000 families through refuge um, community-based services in what, of course, has been a very challenging year with the pandemic. And the stark statistics that you know, I mentioned before when I was before the committee, but eight women have been murdered from the 23rd of March 2020 to the 23rd of March 2021 during that lockdown year. And unfortunately, three more women have been killed since then. And we do count those women. And the reality is the next time we come before you, there will be more women as well. And that's the reality of domestic abuse here in Northern Ireland. And we have to remember when dealing with domestic abuse that many of the issues contained within this specific justice bill are relevant to both domestic and sexual abuse offences. One of those women's cases, one of those 11 women, the case is being dealt with as a potential rough sex defence. She's no longer here to have her voice heard. And as it stands, her alleged perpetrator can make claims about her sexual habits, which are unchallengeable, as she's not here to stand up and speak up against him. One of the other women was in refuge as a child and then returned as an adult. Um, we really have to break that cycle with early intervention and prevention work. And again, you know, look at that whole family unit. It's not just that victim and survivor, but the whole family and that intergenerational trauma that we talk a lot about in Women's Aid. Again, we have the highest rates of femicide in Europe. There was an article in the Sunday Life this week and not a statistic to be proud of. So, you know, we do wonder what is going wrong whenever there's so much work going on. That, you know, we know with the committee and all the pieces of legislation, but it's more than just the legislation. And that's why we call for a dedicated commissioner for domestic abuse to really oversee, to scrutinise and to monitor the work, monitor the strategies and say, you know, what is working well and what is not. Because the recently published PSNI statistics again you know, huge levels, some of the highest levels of domestic abuse in the UK. We also know that these aren't reported. Domestic and sexual violence and abuse cases are very underreported. So there's a spectrum of domestic abuse from physical abuse to coercive control, which is not all included within the new legislation through the Domestic Abuse and Civil Proceedings Act. So we urgently need to create vital new protections which apply irrespective of your relationship status. We need more emphasis on intimate partner sexual violence, and that's very relevant to this justice bill, a more awareness. You know, it really has been a challenge in a few years trying to play catch up with the rest of the UK and indeed Ireland in relation to legal remedies. And we have been overwhelmed, I know, for anyone who works in the policy world with consultations, with calls for evidence, and there's a lot of work goes into that. And it is an opportunity with regard to new legislation and you're looking at so much, but we'll have to get it right and we really have to get it right the first time. And I suppose there is a challenge when drafting new legislation, all of which we know has to be gender neutral, given the crimes disproportionately affect women and girls and how to make sure that it works when implemented to best support victims and survivors. So we welcome the developments within the proposed justice bill, but also see it as an opportunity to change the response to all forms of violence against women and girls. And that's why in March of this year, we launched our petition, calling on all of you in our local assembly to produce a violence against women and girls strategy. Again, the only part of the UK that didn't have one. Um, we raised this in many platforms and we do welcome the decision. We, ha we had support from the Justice Committee because we spoke to you before about this on a number of occasions. And we welcome that you know, the, the move has gone, that that is currently with the Executive Office. But if we had that strategy in place, I do wonder 
how that would change the drafting of legislation and would it impact on that? You know, if we take into consideration the better data set, for example, what is the relation? You know, how many of these crimes are happening in Northern Ireland? Because we don't really know. And um, we, we welcome the development and we do think it will inform us all. In relation to the Justice Sexual Offences and Trafficking Victims Bill, if passed, it will give extra protection to victims of sexual offences. It will give more tools to our justice system to tackle child sexual exploitation and enhance protections for the public by strengthening prevention orders. So we welcome the criminalisation of acts known as upskirting and downblousing, a violation of the victim's privacy and causes great unnecessary distress. Um, we listened to Dr McGlynn's presentation to yourselves and we would support in her recommendations with regard to those crimes not having to show sexual intent. Again, it highlights the need for greater RSA and programmes within our schools to really look at these kind of behaviours. You know, this is more than just a contact offence that can occur online with multiple people, and we must take into account the use of technology, which at the moment in women's aid, we cannot keep up with the volume of abuse that um, takes place without that person being present in the same room. You know, those coercive, those controlling behaviours, but the use of technology for surveillance, GPS, tracking, etc. It's frightening, actually, how that is developing at such a pace. So it's essential that we have a legal framework for adult offenders, but also an understanding that young people need more education to understand what is and isn't abuse. And especially for those young people who demonstrate harmful sexual behaviour as well. There's much work needed and much investment needed in, in all of this work. Also support clause two in relation to sexual grooming. And in relation to all the recommendations around Gillen, you know, we worked very closely with the Gillen Review team whenever they were doing their work. And many women, again, spoke to Sir John and the team and told them about their experiences of the criminal justice system in relation to serious sexual offences. But it's important that the court system is trauma-informed. We've recently completed a piece of training with the Public Prosecution Service, and it was really good to work in partnership with them and really good learning for both of us. And that was out of the recommendation, you know, in the legislation that the PSNI and the PPS had to undertake training in relation to the new domestic abuse offence. But we would strongly recommend that such legislative provisions be extended in circumstances where there is a domestic abuse offence. Those who have experienced domestic abuse should be offered the same protections and considerations within legislation for their protection. If you're a vulnerable witness in a criminal court, you're a vulnerable witness in a family court, and you should be able to... Um, get those remedies with regard to that as well, and the recognition of that too. In relation to trafficking and exploitation, we reiterate and endorse the submission from Belfast and Lisburn Women's Aid and, we, and the Law Centre, and we know that you, you had evidence from Noelle Collins on that. And finally, we'd like to discuss the rough sex defence. You know, it is our position that the law is not currently sufficient to deal with these cases, and it is being used more widely as a defence. And there is a link there between homicide and non-fatal violence against women. So we argue for the need for legislation to outlaw this defence, ensuring that victims have effective recourse to justice and that rough sex cannot be used as an excuse to perpetrate acts of violence against women. So any proposed legislation must take into consideration offences relating to strangulation as well. The campaign group We Cannot Consent to This find that strangulation is a feature in most homicides and over half of non-fatal assaults in which rough sex has been a defence. So we know there's a commitment to bring forward the legislation on fatal, looking at fatal and non-fatal strangulation, and we note that you're talking about that this afternoon. Um, so it is an opportunity, but everything is interlinked. It really is. If you look at the upskirting, the downblousing, the threat to publish images, image-based violence, stalking, course of control, rough sex defence, non-fatal fatal strangulation, and of course domestic homicide, they're all interlinked, and we need to and we would challenge you all to look at it through a gendered lens. 
So everything is outlined in our written submission in much more detail, and I've tried to stick to my 10 minutes as best I could. But we really thank you for, for listening and allowing us the time to present to you today. So we're happy to take any questions. Thank you, Sonia. Just one question for me in relation to your comment in regards to the dedicated commissioner for domestic abuse. What sense have you got from the department or the minister as to whether or not that would be something that they would be uh, in favour of? No, that's definitely gone down the other line. There's going to be a victims of all crime commissioner in yeah, place. Right. That's already gone out for recruitment. Yeah. So we really wanted to see, you know, we have a, a strategy at the moment tack tackling domestic and sexual abuse. We're looking at a call for views. That strategy will be implemented, the new one, early 2023. And how do we know that that strategy has worked? We look at those figures, those statistics from the PSNI, those rates of homicide, and who is scrutinising and monitoring and overseeing it. So we were looking at the possibility of a scrutiny committee or something like that. It was mated as well that the Criminal Justice Inspectorate would be used in that role as well. But you know, we still have recommendations from the Criminal Justice Inspectorate from 10 years ago that haven't been taken up. Yeah. So, but that has gone down a very different road. And we were very, very disappointed, especially if you look at the volume of legislation in this area at the moment that is going through. It's huge. So that was one of our, even a two, three year post for the implementation of all of these developments. I suppose just a comment in terms of the, the crime commissioner, our concern would be that that's not on a statutory basis. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there, there's a long way to go to get to a point where that even has the, the, the teeth yes. that it would need. So that's, mm -hmm. uh, that's something that obviously we are going to have to consideration too, but no, I appreciate that in terms of tarification. That, that, that's useful. Uh, Peter? Yeah, thank you. Thank you for your presentation and also for the um, written submission and I appreciate a lot of ground that's, that's been covered. And I suppose in terms of tackling a range of these issues, it's a mixture. Of, we're focusing in to a large extent, although there can be additional recommendations that come from our report that mm -hmm. are not necessarily amendment driven, but I suppose very specifically, we're looking at the legislation in terms of that, and I appreciate that in terms of the actions that they take, and some will be legislative and some will be sort of practical policy-driven um, issues in relation to it. I suppose maybe just again to probably make uh, one comment for uh, just raise a couple of questions. Um, obviously, I think again what we've got from a range of groups in terms of submissions, and I think there's a lot of merit behind it, particularly on the issues of um, the upskirting and downblousing side of things is a, a strong feeling that, that um, curtailing prosecutions on the basis of a, a motivation hurdle having to be overcome, uh, and it's really ultimately around, I suppose, content and consent type of thing as being the, the critical elements to, to this uh, on that basis. So, uh, maybe I can just ask you then two questions. You mentioned, uh, taking them up to a little bit of verse, you mentioned towards the end in terms of the rough sex defence and uh, I suppose from our point of view, we've not really had an opportunity yet to consider, give careful consideration to the departmental amendment, but uh, obviously we received correspondence today of the department has acknowledged that there would be a need for an amendment mm. and indicated what that is. I'm just wondering in terms of any level of interaction you've had with the department on that, whether you've had a chance to view what they're proposing, any thoughts on it, or um, you know, is there a level of, of proactive reaching out for the department to groups such as your, yourselves and the good work that Women's Aid uh, do? to try to make sure that, as you say, uh, I think you made a very valid point that it's a very important that uh, that not only do we get this right, but we get it right from the start, as mm -hmm. opposed to trying at some future point to do a level of catch-ups up. The first issue just want specifically on the level of, of discussion there's been, if any, with the department on the, the rough sex defence. We, we work very closely with the Department of Justice. I think we've got them on speed dial. They have us on speed dial. We work really, really closely, especially when you look at the, the volume of work that's going on since the Assembly came back, because we were playing catch up. So in relation to the rough sex defence, there was a consultation you know, that has gone out from the Department of Justice. We have met with the minister and officials and have discussed you know, our key issues. And there always is an open door with regard to the department and, and that consultation. And they really do look to those key agencies to inform them. So, you know, we do welcome that. 
And in terms of the, any proposed amendment from the department, in terms of that, have, have, have no. direct engagement on the wording of that? Because again, one of the things. No, we that. haven't got to that stage okay. yet. No. Second thing, just wanted, and it's again perhaps a little bit more generalised. I mean, you mentioned actually about, and rightly, about the, the concern that is there in terms of both reporting and then also even when reporting takes place, then leading to conviction in that regard. And obviously, we need to ensure that um, all complaints are dealt with fairly and there's a fair trial. But uh, again, one of the things I think that, that particularly with regards sexual offences and particularly where it's in a domestic setting, mm -hmm. um, is the level of reluctance or deterrence sometimes that, that are there, uh, particularly for women, in terms of taking this forward. And I just wonder, in terms of trying to remove a sense of hesitancy or reluctance, um, what specific actions beyond what is in directly in the legislation at present, if there's any changes you would say, feel that could help remove some of those barriers so that in terms of, uh, that, I suppose in particular, I think one of the um, concerns would be that for a lot of women, they would, there are a range of maybe, there are a range of reasons why they may feel reluctant, but part of that is then, well, you know, am I going to be believed? Are the hurdles to actually get a conviction so high that I'm not going to overcome them? I'm just wondering, in terms of any practical steps, it could be a moment that would, that would uh, help reduce that sense of deterrence and, and encourage more people to come forward seeking directly justice. Yeah, it's very difficult, especially in relation to sexual offences, because you have the potential that you're putting the father of your children on the sex protection or the sex offenders register. There's all of those different kind of things. The delay is huge, because you could have, uh, you know, they could have reconciled and things could have changed because of that amount of delay. If we had a quicker and tighter time frame with regard to going through that court process, that would be less likely to happen as well. But, you know, we welcome all of the recommendations within Gillen. We feel, I suppose, one of the issues with regard to the recommendations is we feel it didn't capture intimate partner sexual violence enough. It's really complex in relation to the trauma that that victim and survivor experiences. That victim, the perpetrator has access to them constantly. Yeah. So that level of abuse you know, we can never underestimate the trauma that occurs. The re-victimisation within the current court system, and hopefully with the recommendations through Gillen, which are very applicable to both domestic and sexual abuse cases, you know, things will change. But certainly if you look at the level of delay, the re-victimisation, the lack of support and advocate kind of role to take you through that process from the very beginning right through to the <coughs> end. And... You know, I've been a woman's aide for coming up to 25 years, and they're the same issues that have, you know, it's not rocket science. We've just done that piece of work, as I said, with the PPS, and it was great learning for both of us. And looking at these issues, because again, it's so many people drop out. Our attrition rate, you know, looking at all of those key issues. We have 31,000 incidents of domestic abuse, and there was just under 3,000 cases went through to prosecution. You know, where are the rest of all of those cases? You know, and serious sexual offences. We had the PPS um, sexual offences bulletin launched a couple of weeks ago, and it was very, very low with regard to the amount of cases coming through as well. Yeah. It's really hard for someone to, to disclose in the first place, but to put yourself through the, the court system. And it's not the right pathway for everybody. You know, um, for some people, they do want to go down that road, but you need an awful lot of strength. And, and I've supported a lot of women who have gone down that road, and they said it's taken everything out of them, you know? I mean, I, I know from that point of view, I think you make a very, very valid point in terms of the particular concern that is there over um, the, call it the ability of the system and circumstances to eat away at where it's a, an inter, intimate partner, whether or directly on the sexual or physical mm -hmm. violence, uh, again, would suggest that perhaps things haven't, uh, either haven't improved or haven't certainly haven't improved enough, because I know even sort of prior to um, being in the Assembly, I'm, uh, I'm talking about the 1990s, at times being involved as a, as a barrister representing women in, at times in interim PPOs where you were making an ex-party yeah. application um, but then there was that sense of frustration that, that was, I suppose, principally focused in probably more on the physical violence directly mm -hmm. than, than sexual violence, although there can obviously a considerable level of crossover, was the extent to which 
there would be the application, the, the interim PPO, but by the time it then got to the full PPO, it would then be dropped either because of some level of course of pressure or because of some form of reconciliation or, you know, he'll not do that to me again type type thinking on it. So. We need to be able to give people that space for action. That's why yeah. the implementation of domestic abuse protection orders and notices are essential. We go in and we lift that family out of their home instead of being able to take that perpetrator out of their home. Yeah. To give that person the time and space they need to reflect, to get the support they need. And, and things could change and that could look a little bit different. Okay, thank you, Chair. Uh, Rachel? Thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you, Sonia, and it's good to see you again. I feel like we haven't uh, seen each other in a while. We've been talking about legislation here, so um, thank you for your submission. Um, Peter had touched upon a question I wanted to ask, which was about the engagement with the Department on the Rough Sex Defence, but that is already covered. So I just want to bring you to um, your comments in relation to Clause 8 of the Bill. And that is on the removal of anonymity for suspects. Um, if you want, if you would you be able to give us a wee bit more information on on that, and um, if there's any other issues that we would need to consider in relation to to your your opinions on restrictions on the reporting um, of suspects of sexual offences. Hi, hand over uh, to Karen Rachel, so you can answer that one, okay? Hello everyone, um, my name is Karen Devlin. Um, so yes, just regarding Clause 8 on the restrictions on reporting uh, as to suspects of sexual offences. So as highlighted um, in the submission, in the cases of serial uh, uh, perpetrators of sexual offences, it is, is it often the disclosure of their name and charges against them once they are, or have been charged that encourages other victims to come forward? Obviously, you know, a very extreme example would be perhaps the Savile case, um, where once it was reported, more, more victims were coming forward. So we find... Um, you know, when that's been, then that name has been published. Um, in terms of they've been charged with these crimes, and the, and the criminal uh, process begins. Um, it does encourage more people to come forward and, and disclose what has happened to them, because so often for victims they feel like they're alone and it's just them. And then when they hear, no, this happened to other people as well, it's that really kind of that bit of courage. Well, someone else has come forward, maybe I can come forward too, and it's that ripple effect. Um, especially in sexual offences cases. So um, we um, therefore you know, support the removal of MNP on the specific conditions stated in Section 3, Subsection 2 of Clause 8 of, of this Bill under those circumstances. Thank you for that. No, I think that's um, important to, for us to, to look at um, as a committee, uh, you know, in, in relation to this clause. Um, the, uh, and again, just uh, on clause 15, and uh, just sort of bringing back to um, the Domestic Abuse and, and Civil Proceedings, Family Proceedings Act is dead now. Um, and we, we talked about protections for victims in courts. And obviously there had been some provisions put into the Domestic Abuse Act, um, but uh, this submission is talking about having those um, for, you know, further measures to protect in victims whenever there's a domestic abuse offence as well. And that would be in the exclusion of public in court. Could you give us a wee bit more information on that as well? Yeah, I, you know, I really welcome that with regard to you know, I suppose this obviously comes from the the rape trial that we all know about and, and the amount of public that were attending and it was like a day out for people, you know. It was absolutely appalling. And I think for anyone attending court, it's difficult enough without um, people having access to see and hear everything that's going on. And especially in relation to the level of detail and personal information that is disclosed during this time. It is, it's, it's really, really difficult, even as an observer. And, you know, as I have been in court at times, I find it very difficult. You feel like you're intruding in someone's, you know, personal life. So, you know, I, we really welcome all of these amendments. We really do. But we do think a lot of them are applicable in relation to domestic abuse cases. And I suppose the case we would love to get across is domestic abuse is a repeat offence. It really is. And there's really high levels that, I know we have the Serious Crime Unit, for example, within the Public Prosecution Service and we have our panning arrangements and all the rest of it, but a lot of domestic abuse cases don't meet that threshold. And why do they not? Why do we not look at some of those really high-risk cases and maybe do a trial for a year or something like that and see if we can really work 
on this repeat offence and reduce the risk for some of the people in our community. And we see that through the case last week of the sentencing of the young the woman that was murdered in Fermanagh. And you know, that person had a history there. That perpetrator had a history of serious crime. So, you know, we need we need to be getting better at that. And I know the police um, having conversations with them and with the PPS are really open to, to looking at these. Sorry, Rachel, I went off. I don't think I answered your question. I went off on a tangent, answered my own. <laughs> Sorry. No, we absolutely did, Sonia. Thank you. Um, I know I, I don't have any further questions. Your submission is, is great and you really outlined your, your points and certainly I completely agree with you um, on your suggestions for us to, to look at. So um, we'll keep going. We'll maybe get our Domestic Abuse Commissioner and our Violence Against Women and Girls strategy at some point. Yeah. <laughs> Should be good. Thank you. Let's hope so. Thank you. Thanks, Rachel. Uh, Gemma. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Sonia, for coming in and for your written submission. I just have one question, and it's to do with, um, in your written submission, you said we need to catch up and not offer a postcode lottery in relation to pro protections based on our geographical location. Now, being from a rural constituency, I'd be really concerned that we do have a postcode lottery at the minute. So I'm just wondering, what did you mean by that? And do you think that is the case at the minute? Well, I suppose what we mean is the catching up that we have to do. Obviously, the Assembly was down for so many years, we couldn't help that. But, you know, course of control became an offence in England in 2015. You know, so that's just one example. The domestic abuse bill that went through Westminster is much more robust as well. And they're already ahead looking at um, secure tenancies, for example, in relation to domestic abuse cases, looking at... Um, women with insecure immigration status and no recourse to public funds, really formalizing that as well. Um, you know, the rough sex defense, they have the non-fatal strangulation as a specific piece of legislation as well. Also the domestic abuse protection orders and notices. They have had domestic violence protection orders and notices in place for over 10 years, you know? So we are looking at piloting domestic abuse protection orders and notices here in Northern Ireland in two areas is what the Department of Justice is looking at at the moment. One may be rural and one urban. When are we going to get them for the whole of Northern Ireland then? It could be 2023, 2024. And that's that space for action that we said that we need to be able to go in and take that perpetrator out of that home and have that time and space for that person to be able to um, you know, reflect and get the support they need. And that space for action is a model by Liz Kelly, which is actually implemented in strategy in England by the Home Office at the moment, you know, when it's recognised as a need. So, Gemma, there's a list a mile long of other things as well, you know, that we have. And we look at um, uh, especially those orders, stalking, you know, we are moving along with it all, but we do need to get it right, of course, so we don't want to, to move too, pa too fast. But at the moment, we have the protection from harassment order, which I don't know, it's about 20 years old now. And it does not cut it in relation to stalking. You know, we need a definition of stalking and we need the stalking um, protection orders and notices as well. So if I was a victim of domestic abuse or stalking or course of control in England, well, there's a lot more legal remedies open to me at the moment than there is if I live in Belfast. And that's just the reality that we are playing catch up. But we of course recognize all the work of the committee and the Department of Justice who, and the minister who's really pushing all of this through. And also, you know, the work of all the other um, legal agencies as well that I've mentioned today too. You know, there's a real good will and people want to move ahead with it. It's just unfortunate that we, we just had a lapse in our assembly that we're paying for now. No, thank you, Sonia, and I understand, um, uh, but hopefully by the end of this mandate, at least we'll have a wee bit more, we'll be a wee bit more closer to protecting victims fully. Um, that's all my questions. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Sinead. Thank you, Chair, and Sonia, good to see you again, um, and thank you for your written submission. It is quite concise and speaks specifically to each of the clauses. Um, if I could, while you're here, Sonia, Clause 16 on the support for victims of trafficking, etc. And um, you know, we have spoken even with your colleagues about the need for uh, quashing the historical convictions piece and the potential access to health care and social security entitlement 
during um, appeals processes, etc. But I did wonder, um, Sonia, if you have any experience or knowledge of, and it may be unfair to put this to you because you know maybe enough time hasn't passed to even get a clear vision of this, but I'm just conscious of when we are talking about people who are being trafficked or exploited, is there anything we as a committee should be mindful of in terms of um, the there being two jurisdictions on the island? That you know, um, is there any evidence of you know somebody who is being picked up or detected as being suspected of um, you know being a victim disappearing, and they could be you know in Dublin overnight? Mm -hmm. I just want to know maybe if you have any working knowledge of anything that we need to be alert to. Sonia, I'd appreciate that. Thank you. Um, Sinead, I don't know. You had Noelle Collins before you, who's the expert in, um, in women's aid with regard to the trafficking project that Noelle <coughs> has been instrumental in um, developing and working with migrant health here in Northern Ireland. I think there is an issue, especially in relation to Brexit, with regard to the you know, people and coming over the border. And certainly it is an issue that we have um, responded to. But you'll know from speaking to Noel that the volume of people coming through as well is, is really staggering here in Northern Ireland. For some were that we thought it wasn't an issue for so many years, we do know that because of the, the, the way our island works, that there's so much opportunity for people moving you know, across. Um, but I'd have to go back to Noel maybe to get a specific answer, Sinead, sorry, to be able to answer it um, appropriately for you. No, I appreciate that, Sonia, and I do. And to be fair, Noel, you know, did um, point our thinking in that direction. And I suppose, you know, even since that submission, you know, just have to be more crafted in how we maybe approach it, given because we do rightly um, look at other legislators for good practice. But sometimes we do have to give recognition to our uniqueness and the vulnerabilities that that could create. So. If there was anything to be added, I would appreciate it, Sonia. Something we should be conscious of. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Sinead. I will bring that back and get a response to the committee to the question. Okay. Okay, thank you, uh, Sinead. And to uh, members, just check there's nobody else. Is there any other questions? Thank you. And can I just thank you both for coming? Thank you for your submission. And I also thank you for the work that you do. I work closely with Women's Aid, as you know. Naomi Centre in Ballymena, and uh, we just want to say a word of appreciation and thanks for all that you do, and thank you for taking the time to come and see us today. You've given members food for thought and information, and no doubt, as we work our way through this over the next number of weeks, the issues that you have raised will be revisited again by the committee, and we will, any additional uh, information from the department in relation to amendments and so on, we will share those with you. That would be great, thank you. Okay. It would be remiss if I could just add about the resourcing that I didn't put that everything needs a budget attached to it. Yes. And, and that's something, <laughs> I sorry, that I have to. I the mind of the executive yeah. <laughs> at the minute in relation to even to get a budget, but anyway. I know, I know, but I had to get it in there before I left. Okay, thank you so okay. much for your time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay, hey, members, uh, if we then could move to... Uh, agenda item five, and that is the report on the responses to the consultation on the non fatal strangulation legislation. Oh, sorry. Apologies. We're just going to take uh, our ease for a wee minute or two till we get the, the room uh, sanitised. I said the room, not the members. <laughs> <laughs> Any plugs close uh, to here? Uh, I think that. So, hold on. So I'll move up here. Sorry, I'll go to the back stalls. Are you sure there's not? Aye, because there really is one on the back. Move to the back stalls. Thank you. Ah, just to get a, pl a plug for this. No, I don't think I'm right there. <laughs> Oh, 
to be really close to my body. I was going to say a man of all of the many and multitude of talents of our clerk. <laughs> Electrician. I wish we'd have a couple of strings to your bow in that regard. <laughs> okay, you okay members, thank you for your, your uh, help in relation to that. We have the departmental officials attending in person today to outline their responses uh, to the consultation on the non-fatal strangulation legislation and the proposed way forward. The relevant papers are at pages 85 to 100 and 43 of today's uh, pack and can I welcome again to uh, the committee uh, Brian uh, Grimmick, the Deputy Director of Criminal Justice Policy and Legislation and Angela Bell, the Head of Branch Sentencing Policy Unit at the Department uh, of Justice and also just to advise our colleagues that the session will be reported by Hanser and the transcript published on the web page. The committee's web page. Brian, you're very welcome, uh, along with Angela today, to the committee. Thank you again for coming uh, to uh, see us and to provide an overview of the response to the consultation. So we'll ask you just to make your comments and then members will have questions. Thank you. Right. Well, thank you very much, Mr Chairman. I, I think you may be seeing quite a lot of me over the next <laughs> few months. So, in fact, uh, I'll obviously have to reserve my seat. Just give me one second, I'll grab some of your water. Okay. Right, well, um, <coughs> uh, as, as you know, I'm Brian Grzymek, Deputy Director, now Deputy Director of Legislation. I've shed some of my other responsibilities, but I'm focusing exclusively on our legislative programme for the last uh, period of the mandate, okay. uh, given it's quite a heavy load. Yes. Uh, with me is Angela Bell, one of my deputies, who's head of the Sentencing Policy Unit within my division, and uh, one of my lawyers as well. So, um, so if you had to say, not say any, any, to be nice to lawyers day today. <laughs> um, anyway, I, we're certainly very pleased to be able to brief the committee on, on the public consultation on non-fatal strangulation legislation, and also on the department's plans for going forward. The issue came to the department's attention uh, following the Criminal Justice Inspection Report of 2019, uh, which covered the handling of domestic violence and abuse cases. So I would say uh, non-fatal non strangulation is much broader than just um, covering, covered by domestic abuse. Uh, the the um, inspectorate uh, recommended that the department should address the perceived inadequacies in legislation regarding the act of choking or strangulation. The minister recognised this as an important issue and asked uh, my... my my division to carry out a, a review just to, to establish the facts. A preliminary scoping exercise revealed difficulties with the existing offence of strangulation. It found that the 1861 Offences Against a Person Act, um, which actually covers it, um, uh, has resulted in it only being an indictable offence, um, uh, meaning it, can, it cannot be pr prosecuted in the magistrate's court. However, while it carries a possible life sentence, the, the current strangulation offence can only be charged where there's evidence of intent to commit another indictable offence. So you cannot be charged on, under indictment solely for strangulation. If it was strangulation and attempted murder or something like that, they certainly could go forward, but you cannot take it actually as an indictable offence if it's only the act of strangulation itself. Um, as you'd appreciate, this creates um, all very obvious problems and explains why the offence is so rarely used. Um, just to give you an example, statistics from 20, 2002 to 2020, well, an 18 year period, showed there were 502 suspects charged with the offence, but only 20 of those charges resulted in the prosecution of strangulation. In all other cases, um, they weren't de dealt with as strangulation, and the PPS um, felt uh, that in the majority, all those cases, the uh, prosecution of strangulation itself would not be successful. Uh, and they chose alternative offences. Typically, those offences would have been um, assault, assault occasion, actual bodily harm, or false imprisonment. Um, these are, in effect, much lesser offences, and as such, would have attracted a much lo a lower sort of um, sentence. While alternative charges allow the offender to be dealt with, 
they, they don't, they're not ideal. They, they fail to recognise the unique nature of strangulation and the importance of having the offence explicitly recorded on the offender's criminal record. Typically, they would be recorded as bodily harm, not as strangulation. And that's significant because strangulation has been identified as, a, as a, an indicator of likely more serious future offending. International research shows that an offender who strangles is, is six to seven times more likely to go on to kill than those who do not. So in essence, it is a potential marker for future behavior. The use of alternative charges also limits the court sentencing ability to that available for the alternative sentence. This is problematic as the damage caused by strangulation can far exceed normal assault injuries. And we know that District Judge McElholm uh, has been quite outspoken on this and he's been also particularly in insightful about the offence. He's made public his concerns regarding the restricted sensitive powers available to him when dealing with cases involving strangulation in the magistrate's court. Our review team undertook considerable pre-consultation research drawing on the expertise of our non-fatal strangulation reference group, attending specialist training and carrying out, sig carrying out significant desk research uh, all this highlighted the new approaches being developed in our other jurisdictions, notably in England, Wales, Australia, New Zealand, and in some American states. So this is a, a, an offence which is becoming more recognised internationally, and certainly there are a number of examples where it actually is being addressed actively at the moment. We learned about the long-term and unseen effects of strangulation, or we learned about the long-term effects, and recognised the clear need to educate the public, the medical professionals, and the criminal justice agencies on the seriousness of the offence. Because, because it is not often um, prosecuted as strangulation, it, it remains fairly hidden and not a, necessarily appreciated for the seriousness of the offence. We also learnt that strangulation is a complex issue. It can be committed for a wide variety of reasons, from being a purely violent or sadistic act or a, or a tool for domestic control or coercion, right through to being an element of consensual sex. This introduces another facet to the difficulties of dealing with it as an offence. Members are aware of the Department's related consultation on the so-called rough sex defence and our intention to bring an amendment to the current Justice Bill to outlaw that defence where serious harm occurs. Against this backdrop, our cons consultation on non-fatal strangulation focused primarily on the need for new legislation and education. The consultation closed on 24 September 2021, having been extended you know, on request from a respondent, giving a total consultation period of 11 weeks. Uh, that included summer break. Members will appreciate that consultation during a pandemic has not been ideal. However, we offered respondents the opportunity to engage directly with team members, if they wished, to discuss any aspect of the consultation. And I know myself and some of my, my, my team have had some very useful conversations with a number of interests. We also provided for responses online via citizen space and made special provision for email and hard copy responses. In all, 25 responses were received from individuals and organisations and there was a significant consistency across their responses. There was strong support for the introduction of a new offence with higher maximum penalties and for a programme of education underlying, underlining that improved public safety is not solely a justice issue. Education is, as I hear, as in other areas, is an important theme already picked up by the Gillen Review. As previously advised, following our earlier rough sex defence consultation, our intention is to link into the Gillen work to promote a common approach across the department when it comes to, to education. Regarding a new offence, issues around the definition and the highly gendered nature of the offence were raised. The committee is also aware that a group of respondents are calling for a new offence where death occurs in the context of sexual activity. We have given um, this suggestion careful consideration and have discussed its merits with departmental legal advisers and the public prosecution service. Uh, to um, cut to the chase, we consider that the current law on murder and manslaughter makes sufficient provision and do not need further addition. We would be happy, of course, to expand on this with the committee uh, uh, when it, either today when it asks, raises questions, or indeed actually later on in, the, in this process. The Minister has agreed that a new standalone offence of non-fatal strangulation 
triable in either the Magistrates Court or the Crown Court should be introduced. The new offence should be accompanied by significant, by significant maximum penalties of two years imprisonment in the Magistrates Court or for up to 14 years in the Crown Court. This will allow recognition of the, the true nature of the offence and its seriousness recorded at all levels. Two years, as you know, is an exceptional penalty for the Magistrates Court, with only a very small number of other offences carrying such a maximum. We consider that this would do much to address the concerns regarding offences prosecuted at that level. Setting a 14, year, 14 years as the maximum in the Crown Court significantly exceeds the seven-year maximum available for commonly used alternative charges, such as assault occasioning actual, assault occasioning actual bodily harm. It aligns with the centres available for our recently created domestic abuse offence, recognising the often coercive nature of strangulation as well as the nature of the injuries that may occur. It is also consistent, and it's also worth noting that our, that our proposed maximum sentence is higher than that available in other parts of the UK. The Minister's intention has been to prepare this new offence for introduction early in the next mandate. <clears throat> However, on reflection, she can see some advantage in, 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 um, in bringing this forward earlier, perhaps possibly under the, um, the Justice Bill still, still to come. Um, having said that, you know, clearly there is an issue of scope and a moment that we're looking at this carefully. Um, but in principle, you know, it's one which we might, might be able to introduce earlier if, it's, if it would fit into the scope of that bill. Um, and <coughs> I have a last page. Uh, <clears throat> we are now working to develop, we are now working to just, just to develop actually possible instructions to take that forward if that's the way that it, uh, we decide to proceed. And of course, that would be very much contingent on the Speaker's decision about scope. Now, I think that brings me to the end of our initial uh, um, introduction. I'm very happy, um, Chairman, to pick up any queries or questions regarding this, um, this um, presentation. And I'm, I'm, I know in the coming weeks we'll be talking in much more detail about uh, this and other issues. And, and thank you, Brian. Thank you for that. And just for my own clarity, because I'm not a, a, a legal person or a lawyer, why would there be a difference in tariff between a Crown Court and a Magistrates Court? The Crown, because the Crown Courts are where all serious offences are, are charged. They have right. capacity to actually, uh, they uh, will typically involve juries, they have capacity of giving up to life sentences. The Magistrates Court, where the majority of offences actually are actually tried, tend to be for lesser offences. They have a lower, there is actually, there are some cases which are, are hybrid, which can go to either, depending on the degree of seriousness. Yeah, right. But there are many cases which will, that would be reserved for the Magistrates Court, typically the motoring offences, I mean, probably some, some assaults, lower, lower level assaults and other things like that. But in essence, that's how the system is structured, to allow, allow actually the, the, the expertise of, the, um, of the, crowd, the judges in the Crown Court to be focused on the very serious cases and the magistrates are doing in the more routine, lower level cases. And Mr Chairman, the yes. magistrates' court sentencing jurisdiction is normally restricted to six months maximum imprisonment. So yeah. the proposal for a two-year maximum in this case is quite an exception. I appreciate that clarification. In paragraph 26 of the report, uh, uh, and on the, the responses, that's for members, that's page 94 of, of our meeting pack, it states that the defence of consent should only be outlawed where strangulation results in serious harm. Does that mean that consent may be used as a legitimate defence in other cases where serious harm may not have been caused to the victim? Consent, clearly, we have to, I, I, we have to differentiate between um, behaviour which um, is consented to and which is not intended or indeed causes, causes harm um, and clearly there is consensual sex where there, some, of the, some of these behaviours may exhibit, but at the same time there is no intention that they will cause harm and uh, the, the, both participants um, agree to this sort of behaviour. Uh, we're not trying to actually sort of, uh, deal with that, but we're very clear that in fact strangulation can be used for coercion, it can be used um, with wanton recklessness which could actually result in, in serious harm or indeed actually um, a more serious outcome. 
So essentially, I think what you're, what you're trying to do is draw a line between normal, what is on essentially behaviour which is, is um, consensual and actually with no intention of causing any damage or harm, and that which actually is reckless or in fact deliberately or intentionally aimed to actually um, cause damage, uh, which in some cases could even be fatal. Okay. I don't know, Angela, do you want to add to, add to that? No, that, um, obviously this links in with the consent to serious harm for sexual grat gratification uh, consultation and the proposed amendment yes. to the Justice Bill. Yeah, well, just, I suppose so it's to create some consistency. And, and, and that's the reason why, in the, in the light of Brian's comments in regards to the amendment in regards to the rough sect, it was just to try and ensure that there was a consistency uh, so that we're... Yeah. Yes, we're, yes. What the, we're saying in one, we're also saying in the, the other. The levels but, will match up. Yes, yes. yes. Right, okay. Yeah, it will. And I would say, you know, clearly on, on the rough sex defence, um, no one has the right to consent to actually damage, allow someone to damage them. That's what, essentially the gist of what the rough sex is, um, defense is. But uh, they, they have certainly the capacity to consent to actually so-called playful activity, which hasn't, there is no intention to cause any form of damage. But certainly um, um, we need to draw a careful line, and, and the, the two um, are very consistent. Indeed, actually, initially, had we as we, uh, the minister originally planned, had we gone ahead with actually introducing these in the next mandate of the rough sex defence, we would have actually had the rough sex and the non-sexual um, strang the non non um, uh, non-fatal strangulation. We would have done them in uh, together, whereas in fact we accelerated the rough sex defence because the minister felt that this was important to take it forward at that point. Okay, thank you. We're going to go to members. Um, Shaniad. Thank you, Chair, and thank you for the presentation. I suppose um, I would be eager to know, in terms of the timing of this, the likelihood of this being included in the Justice Bill, because obviously this in it of itself is a significant area um, for us to scrutinise and give full consideration to. And saying that, I hope it does. You know, I would like to see it um, making its way through. But just for one point of clarity, um, I just wasn't clear about it when you were present there. In terms of then the the distinction made, obviously fatal strangulation, are there clear records of death by strangulation? Because you did mention that um, non-fatal strangulation, you know, they're more likely um, to to be then, uh, I suppose somebody who does um go ahead and uh, with that act and then it does sadly become maybe a fatal strangulation so i hear the argument about a new a new offence and i'm just wondering our data capture at the moment do, do we have a clear reading of how many deaths are caused by strangulation um, I think the short answer is probably no, because essentially, um, whereas non-fatal strangulation, certainly we were able to identify it, and we know of the 500 cases over 18 years, only 20 were actually pursued as non-fatal strangulation cases, and that's because they obviously had other indictable offences linked to them. Um, what we do know is where someone is indicted for murder, the, the, uh, the charge isn't strangulation, the charge is murder. And ultimately, the detail of how the murder occurred, where strangulation might well have been a factor, but it could well have been accompanied with other, other violent acts, um, we, we wouldn't, that, that wouldn't routinely be picked up through our, our, um, our, our, um, our systems. Um, the other thing is, of course, on the strangulation itself, because most cases, um, because you have, they can't easily link it to another indictable offence, it tends to go to the lower court, and it goes as actual bodily harm or, in fact, grievous bodily harm or some, uh, some other offence. And whereas we have been able to identify a number of cases, you know, I'm, I couldn't with all confidence say that that, that, that number couldn't, that there aren't other cases where strangulation was deployed, but where it, it, was, it, it couldn't be picked up. So I think when we actually have a specific offence of not, um, related to strangulation, that will actually give us good data, which will allow us to actually have a very clear picture. At the moment, I think the picture isn't complete but certainly from what we have got, we can clearly see that, that in many cases where strangulation is, is, is used, uh, it, it is not pursued as strangulation, but rather as a lesser offence. OK, thanks, Brian. Yeah, and I, I, I concur with what you're saying, because if it's silent on that sort of data, then the whole messaging around, you know, the non-fatal um, strangulation leading into 
fatal strangulation. I think the whole, you know, we need to expose everything around it and everywhere that we are touching on it in the legislation. In terms of then the likelihood, and I know maybe it's, I, I, I guess that's been presented to the speaker for consideration. Is there any sort of time frame around um, when that determination might be made, Brian? Well, at the moment it, isn't, it hasn't been presented, but we're not at that point yet. Um, but what we have done is we are talking to the uh, Office of Legislative Draftsman, uh, and we are actually doing some work there in, uh, in, the, in the potential expectation that we could take it forward. But, but there is a very real question of scope. As you know, the Minister wanted to bring forward a miscellaneous provisions bill, which would have actually been, uh, allowed us to actually have introduced it without any problem. But um, because of problems um, uh, in the executive, we actually ended up going for a much reduced, much narrowly, more narrowly scoped bill. And the consequence of that is, in fact, you know, there is some uncertainty about just whether this will fit in. I should also say, I know it was, there was a suggestion this might have been included against the, the domestic abuse bill, and I think that was opposed by the department at the time because we felt that was too narrow. Because the truth is, non-fatal strangulation isn't often is used in domestic abuse, but not, but but it's also used um, for. Um, uh, in a number of other areas, you know, and certainly for coercion or indeed actually for in terms of actual uh, physical violence. So it, at one level was actually it's about it is actually quite a broad offence. It doesn't just fit neatly into one category. So um, you know, we'll be, we had some problems about potentially putting it in domestic abuse in the sexual offending and trafficking victims. Um, that's probably sort of we think it's probably broad enough, but at the same time, in fact, it was still be a, you know, it would still go beyond sexual offending and it would still go uh, beyond trafficking victims. So it could, it could be that the scope might still rule it out. So this is something we, we are both doing some preparatory work f towards, but also it's something which we'll pick up in due course. So the, the minister is minded to actually introduce it, but again, that will be con contingent on whether we think it, it will fall into scope ultimately. Thank you, Brian, and I'd appreciate, and, and I'm sure you will keep the committee abreast of that. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, uh, Sinead. Gemma. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Brian. Sorry, my camera's off. I didn't realise it. No. Um, Brian, no, thank you. And I um, just want to say that Sinn Féin fully supports the new event, uh, offence on uh, of non fatal strangulation. Um, you know, we see that the, there's a given strong indicator of possible future homicide. But I'm just wondering, um, I know we, we responded to the consultation and we suggested that maybe um, a maximum penalty of more than seven years. Um, but I'm just wondering now that you have gone, it was originally seven years, um, but now you have jumped to 14. And I'm just wondering, how did you arrive at this position? And um, you know, would this be the highest maximum sentence in all jurisdictions? That you know of. Um, uh, and the last, last point, um, possibly yes at this moment, although in fact that, uh, that we're on moving sand in these issues. Uh, I would say that my division, one of our responsibilities is actually to look at the, the consistency of, of offences and penalties across uh, all legislation. So wherever a department is developing legislation where there's a criminal offence, they will consult us as to what constitutes the right, the right level to ensure it is proportionate and, con and consistent with equal and similar offences. When we actually put this thing out for consultation, the other uh, was um, pick, probably most people went for seven years rather than the other. The other was a bit uncertain. But when we actually gave this further consideration and we looked at actually the out of what came out of the domestic abuse bill, whereas in fact the, the most serious offence was 14 years, uh, noting uh, the fact that uh, non-fatal strangulation is often linked into dom domestic abuse, it, was, it seemed um, inappropriate that, in fact, we would have had a lesser sentence for non-fatal strangulation, which is often used for coercive purposes, um, than we would have had actually through the domestic abuse bill. So when it came to consistency, we felt on the principle of consistency um, um, that, that the higher sentence was, was, was appropriate. And certainly, I say we, um, we hadn't offered the higher sentence at the time, which, looking back at it, I suspect maybe we could have done. Um, but you know, we live and learn. We don't always get these things um, absolutely right. And certainly, on reflection, looking at actually the domestic abuse bill, we felt it, it looked it, it looked right that uh, that this, the maximum sentence should should be consistent with that in in, in that bill. That's fair enough. No, and the, the reason I asked was because it wasn't offered in the consultation. But yeah. no, that's fair enough. Thank you for that answer, Brian. That clears it up. Thank you, Chair. Thank 
Thank you, Gemma. Rachel. <clears throat> Thank you, Chair, and thank you very much for your presentation um, on this. I suppose there's been a number of questions um, that have already been discussed, but just um, if, if this is something that does, that can meet the scope of the Sexual Offences Bill, um, that would certainly be, uh, be welcome to try and fit it in. Um, in. In terms of if it doesn't, is the, um, is the, so the, the um, plan then still as it is in the document that it would be um, a, a new bill or would it be part of a miscellaneous bill or the sentencing bill that, they, that we've been hearing about that is planned for the next mandate? Well, at the moment, and bearing in mind that, that, that we don't know who the next min Justice Minister will be, at the moment our, our, um, our, our Minister is quite clear that, in fact, from her perspective, the first two bills from Justice in the next mandate should be the miscellaneous provisions bill in year one and the sentencing bill in year two. As you know, um, the Miscellaneous Provisions Bill, the, the core of it, the rump of it, is already actually sitting there, actually drafted. Although we would certainly use that to add in things like probably remote court access and potentially um, uh, non-fatal non strangulation. Although it could equally well fit into the sentencing bill a year later. Um, so that would be a matter for the de decision by the, the next minister if, if it doesn't come in in this mandate. Um, on the face of it, though, in fact, um, I think you know it, we would certainly, um, in principles, try to see whether we can fit it into the into this uh, the bill, this mandate, and I think that would be uh, quite appropriate because if we have, we've already committed to putting rough sex in, so you know it would, wouldn't be inconsistent to have it in in that bill. But I am conscious that time is not on our side, and we're not clear about the um, about the, the, uh, what the speaker may decide regarding scope. So there are a few question marks there. So did I answer all your questions, Rachel? I, I think I may have gone off at a tangent. No, you did. It was just to see what the plan was. You know, if we couldn't get it into the, this bill that we're considering at the moment, if it is going to oh, you yeah. know, be a miscellaneous and then sentencing. And okay, I, know, I, know I, remember point, just... I, I know the point I missed. I was going to say we're not seeing this as a separate bill. You know, but really, I think one or two, probably one clause. Probably one clause with yeah. maybe five or six. Yeah. So we know we're not going to produce one clause bills for the assembly, for the committee to consider. You know, it would make much more sense for it to be folded into either the miscellaneous provisions bill or the sentencing bill. Thank you. No, I appreciate that clarification. Remember discussing this in the Domestic Abuse um, Act as well, and it was obviously then wouldn't have met the offence, you know, the criteria of two or, two or more occasions and then personally connected, so there would be issues with that. So certainly um, welcome, welcome that coming in in whatever form. Um, the summary document states that two respondents from an academic discipline each provided a detailed critique of the strangulation offence created in the English Domestic Abuse Act in 2021 and warned against a direct copy and not that um, we would be copying legislation from other jurisdictions directly, but in terms of the, um, the discussions that the department are having uh, possibly about putting this into the Sexual Offences Bill, is, are you looking along the same lines or is it, is it, um, how is that sort of informing your consideration of draft legislation? Well, uh, at the moment we are obviously recognising that in fact um, we're still in a slight limbo um, on this one. Uh, we are certainly preparing some instructions which would, uh, I think, uh, I'm expecting OLC to actually put a bit of time towards. I would just say that, in fact, um, uh, the committee may not have heard, but one of our principal draftsmen um, on the, on the, uh, the um, uh, stalking, protect, pre protection from stalking bill, David Sewell, who was an, an, uh, an excellent draftsman and actually a very great support to us uh, in my division, uh, died over the weekend. Uh, unexpectedly. So, in fact, that was a great shock to us all. And, in fact, um, you know, it ha I know OLC will, will have found him, his loss to be quite serious. And, and I know the first legislation is actually seeing what he can do to reshuffle work to, to fill that void. So that's, I think, I maybe should just put that on the record, you know, our appreciation of all the good work that David Sewell did and the fact that his loss actually is also going to be could have some knock-on effects downstream as we're trying to get things drafted. But I know the Office of the, the First Legislative Draftsman is trying to, to reshuffle his, his troops to actually ensure we continue to get good cover. Um, but certainly that... Um, sorry, I, I think I've not covered your next point. Can you remind me what your question was? Sorry, I, just, I thought I should just re refer to David because I think it was, it was actually a very important part of... Uh, the team that we work with and his losses are going to be uh, it's a significant one. 
No, Brian, you're just right, and my sympathies go to yourselves in the department and also in, in, in OLC, and I think you're very uh, correct in mentioning that. Um, and it, in terms of the question, it was just around, um, are we looking down the lines of something very similar to England, um, because people had warned against doing that in, in the consultation, or was it going to be something just more dis more bespoke to Northern Ireland? Well, I will give a few words, and I'll pass it over to Rachel, who, uh, Rachel to, <laughs> to Angela, who will keep me right. Now, at the end of the day, uh, one of the, the advantages of actually following behind England and other jurisdictions is we can learn from, from the good things they do, but also be warned about actually problems. So clearly, we haven't just looked at England. As I said in my, in my opening remarks, we have looked at a number of jurisdictions and what they do. So um, I think it's fair to say we'll, we'll try to, to where we can to learn from the good and, and learn from the bad as well. So, Angela, do you want to... Now I know who, who you are, Angela. Do you want to add to that? Yes. There were, there were a couple of specific points that were raised in relation to the English clause, um, and they uh, centred around definitions, which uh, we need to look at maybe in a little bit more detail since we have the benefit of time on our side to do that. Um, certainly it was pointed out that suffocation, strangulation, asphyxiation, choking are all slightly different things, and they need to be recognised, and a definition needs to pick those, uh, those issues up. And the other point was in relation to the sentencing, which we've already discussed um, in England and Wales, they, they went with uh, the very sort of standard magistrate's court's maximum sentence and a maximum of five years in the Crown Court, which we felt we felt didn't reflect the, the seriousness of the offence. And certainly the responses we received were all very much emphasising the, the seriousness of this offence and the uh, unforeseen outcomes that can occur. So those are two areas where we certainly wanted to look at as something maybe a little bit different. And the other uh, issue was um, the English section refers to the intentional or reckless infliction of serious harm. And reckless is a con concept that we find quite difficult in law. And we want to try and make the legislation as clear as possible so that there is as, as little confusion as possible in its application. Thank you, Angela. Thank you, Brian, for that. Um, finally, for me, I just it's about consent. And we'd, um, it says in the, in the consultation summary about can, the issue of consent is a difficult one. And I know we, we do discuss this quite a bit. And obviously, the committee are looking um, at the Justice Bill at the moment. And uh, last week, we had the PPS in front of us. And I'd raised as part of the Gillen review um, things that hadn't, recommendations that haven't been implemented or legislated on. And one of them was recommendation 155. And that was um, on consent. And that was a recommendation that the sexual offences order 2008 should be amended to strengthen the law when it comes to issues of consent. But this obviously hasn't happened, and that's something that the you know the department will be taking forward in the future. But just in terms of dealing with 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 this uh, issue, um, and if we don't legislate for consent on this on this recommendation that Gillen has put forward on on changing the current law. But do um, legislate on 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 this non-fatal strangulation. Is there any issues in in not having that consent law uh, strengthened um, in terms of rolling out any new offences that involve consent? Well, as I said at the beginning, when you looked at um, at the um, <clears throat> the case of a rough sex defence, you know you are not able to, in common law at the moment. You're not able to consent to actually allow someone to damage you. Um, uh, so, um, uh, uh, but we're bringing we're bringing the rough sex defence in because we feel that you know that that common law on the margins can be open to interpretation. So, bringing that rough sex defence issue in really specifically to, to de deal with that problem of consent. On this one, certainly, um, we recognise, and there may well be a case for judges to make a, try to differentiate between um, consensual sexual games, which perhaps. You know, um, uh, uh, against um, uh, actual an, an offence, there's always an issue on the margins there. But certainly, what we're very clear is, in fact, where actually so this is uh, where strangulation takes place, uh, other than where it would be for consensual sex in a, in a non-dangerous sort of way, uh, it will be covered by the law. So I'm, I'm not absolutely sure we're particularly hit by the, the, the consent issue. That being said, I think consent is an area which, in fact, we need much more work done. And I know the Gillen uh, recommendation is being considered and will go, will go forward. And I think that whole area of consent, this is something which I think really is about education. 
uh, because uh, in essence, in fact, what we are getting too often is perhaps youngsters uh, having too ready access to pornography and actually the lines between actually what is uh, normal and acceptable behaviour uh, and cons consensual behaviour and actually what, and what they see on the, um, maybe um, in a sort of a, uh, in a dramatic sort of way and on, on TV or in, uh, on, on websites uh, can blur edges and I think that is a concern to us all and I think that consent issue is very important but in this area I think, I think we're fairly clear that the actual consent issue shouldn't really be an issue uh, other than where it comes to consensual sex and then as we've said already in the, in the, non in the uh, rough sex defence it is not you cannot act as a, it cannot be a defence that you that you actually ca uh, agree to carry out dangerous activities which damage an individual thank you brian um no i, I totally agree with the, the you know white young especially young people um but also other others um access and sort of well basically their rsa online um, and how dangerous that can be. So I suppose just to um, say it again, as to do every week, that we need mandatory comprehensive RSE for, for people in Northern Ireland. And Chair, I'll leave that there. Okay. Well, that's a matter for another department, of course, Rachel. Uh, we have no jurisdiction on, on education. Thank you. Peter? Thank you. And thank you, Brian and Angela, for your um, evidence. Before. I mean, I find myself very much in terms of the direction of travel um, of what you've outlined today very much in, in a similar position. It's, it's very hard to argue, to be perfectly honest, against the, the proposals. I mean, I would also, in terms of those, um, take a view that in terms of the vehicle which is used for this, um, you know, I wouldn't take a particular doctrinaire view. It has to be a particular vehicle, although I think the general principle that, that the sooner we can make the changes to the legislation, uh, yeah. the better. Obviously, the constraint will be what is within scope and what, what is outside the scope. Um, I suppose just three points. Um, on the, the consultation, you've listed obviously there are 25 um, responses, but unless I've missed it, and I, again, I think one of the things which provides a level of reassurance, uh, I think, to the committee is looking at the individual answers to the individual questions. There is across the board, it seems to be a broad consensus on pretty much all of them. Um, unless I missed it, though, there's, there's not a list of the people that have or the organisations that have responded to the 25. It may be useful. Um, to have those just able to provide us with a level of reassurance that, it's, that in terms of responses wide enough on, on the scope or maybe there's a reason why uh, but also you mentioned about for instance a couple of responses from people with particular expertise and I think having sort of at least knowing who had responded may at the committee that, that in whatever vehicle is being used that, that we can maybe then there may be people that we could go to that, that, that well I think be. we can given it's not a big number Angela you could probably get read out that the main yeah. organizations we obviously individuals who weren't named but the, no, the I believe even I mean rather than just directly I mean if, if it can just be forwarded oh to yeah we can forward that to the, to, the committee to the, to the, second thing I suppose um, I presume just to again to pick your brains on you mentioned um, because there's, there's to some extent there's a dual purpose I think has been we've been we're putting it in terms of the specific offence uh, and one is that therefore for the specific actions of the, of the that there's a, a clear criminal sanction that is put in place for the offence directly itself but also that it that acts as a, a certain level of red flag towards hopefully then a levels of intervention which will prevent direct homicide yes uh, as we were picking up on Sinead's point earlier on um, and obviously that the, the direct data um, is, is, is difficult to draw out because of the nature of the way there's been recording of these crimes. And presumably, though, um, Sinead had, had highlighted the potential where there is either one or a series of, of, of actions where there's been non-fatal um, strangulation leading at some point then to a fatal strangulation. Mm -hmm. But presumably also, it can also be indicative of um, other sort of um, problematical and criminal behaviour, be it in terms of the course of control, particular approaches, for example, uh, maybe in terms of a male towards a female, for instance, where it actually can lead to homicide, where actually the, the, the cause of death is not though necessarily strangulation, that non-fatal strangulation yeah. can lead to a course of action, for example, that may lead to homicide, for example, in terms of uh, maybe a stabbing, for instance, and on that basis on it. Um, so, I mean, presumably, therefore, the, the, the number of instances would be wider than simply leading on to a strangulation as a, 
as a cause would that be? Yeah, I think that we're not picking up strangulation consistently uh, as it is. The reality is, of course, you know, we, and also I'm very conscious that, in fact, the number of homicides in Nornan is actually extraordinarily low compared to some countries, mm-hmm. uh, interestingly. Uh, but that being said, clearly um, we recognise that non-fatal strangulation is, appears in a number of areas. It, it appears in domestic abuse, and we know actually a certain number of domestic abuse is case result in homicide. It, it certainly appears, it can appear actually uh, in, in, in when it comes to coercion and control. It could even appear in trafficking, uh, trafficking victims, where some of the victims being trafficked are controlled by threats of violence and um, and life-threatening sort of um, um, experiences. Um, so I think, in fact, it isn't, it's a, it isn't a useful marker, uh, but at the same time, what it does highlight is, in fact, where people are co- using this for coercion or as, as violence. We know it is a highly risky, um, risky sort of behaviour. Mm-hmm. And um, I'm sure, in fact, or even a number of cases where homicides occurred, the intent, what, intent wasn't necessarily to murder. It may just have been to control, and it's got out of hand. Mm-hmm. Um, but clearly, it is a highly risky behaviour, and, and if we can actually identify it and record, register it, that does give us the capacity to actually sort of perhaps to act or intervene in, in, in different and better ways. You know, as you said, it can act as a mark in a range of, of circumstances, yeah. and I suppose... And certainly, where you've got someone who has a history of that, it could well be. You know, we've got, we do have a number of fair, uh, orders which we can, we, can, we can use, sort of, Masram and other, other sort of mechanisms. You know, there are some mechanisms where we do keep a closer watch on individuals where they have uh, known sexual or, um, or violent um, predispositions. Uh, and clearly, if a prosecution can either on the one hand, can, can lead to a criminal sanction in that particular case, but also act as a marker to prevent um, further crimes taking place, and whether that's on the basis of a um, bait sort of human trafficking or coercion or whatever. Uh, but I suppose the other thing as well is, well, the number of uh, cases of, of maybe direct, where it leads on to homicide may be relatively low. If, if it can, I suppose we'd all agree that, that if it can lead even in a single instance, to prevention of, of a homicide Absolutely. further down the line. I think it yeah. would be valuable. Uh, final point I just want to ask, I, I was intrigued at uh, something Angela said, and I suppose this is just to delve a little bit in from the definitional point of view. Uh, Angela, you'd mentioned, I think, I think one of the responses you'd got um, said that in terms of, from a definitional point of view, the distinction between strangulation, uh, maybe a degree of something with asphyxiation, um, with suffocation, etc., from the point of view, therefore, of moving ahead in terms of non-fatal strangulation, would the definition be focused in <coughs> on the strangulation side of it, or would there be uh, any scope or intention to go wider? That, that um, not necessarily whether they're allied, but you know, where you've got those other type of, of um, situations, would you intend? to have something which would capture all of those, or would it be purely focused in on, on strangulation? I think we would want to make it as wide as possible to cover mm. all of those um, stopping of breath or stopping of blood, access to the brain, oxygen to the brain, all of those scenarios ought to be covered so that we, we don't miss a trick. Okay, I think that, that would be, yeah. very, uh, be a, a reassuring thing. Okay, thank you. We're using strangul- non-fatal strangulation as a cipher. Essentially, it's all, yeah. of, all of those behaviours where... There's an intentional effort to actually perhaps put the fear of God, in, uh, fear of life, uh, 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 into an individual through actually restricting their their their, their oxygen, oxygen, or indeed actually, as Andrew says, says, actually preventing the flow of blood to the brain. So, um, well, I will aim to catch. And all presumably, those on that basis, can. you you would be able to provide a a sort of a drafted definition that we'd be able to cover. <coughs> Although you obviously explored that already. That's, that's our on intent. That, on that yeah. regard, on it, because again, uh, again, obviously. To think ahead, obviously, we want to make sure that that, that where the offence is there, that, that someone doesn't try and use a loophole and say, well, actually, you know, this wasn't strangulation, it yeah. was, you know, yeah. whatever, Absolutely. that it, it doesn't fall within that, that definition. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, members. Just want to check. Rachel, can I add, uh, no other questions? No. No. Chair, could I just briefly come in? Sorry, yeah, Chair. Okay. Thank you. No, Chair, if I could just take the opportunity, appreciate you letting me back in, just to thank Brian for making us aware of the passing of David Saul. Um, obviously, his significant work was going on behind the scenes, you know, in this committee, and it, it's very much appreciated. And I just want to thank Brian for making us aware, but to offer my condolences to his family, his friends, and his colleagues who clearly hold him in very high esteem 
as has been expressed here by Brian. So thank you. And thank you, Sinead. And, and in conclusion, uh, Brian, we would like you to take back to uh, your colleagues in the department and also uh, we will endeavour to extend our sympathy to Brian and his family. It's certainly very sad news and uh, our thoughts and prayers are with everyone who has been affected by this very sad and untimely death. So thank you. And thank you for, as Sinead has said, thank you for making that uh, aware to us today. Thank you, Angela, for your attendance on Brian, for the information. And no doubt, as you've said, uh, we will be seeing more of you over the next number of weeks. That's yeah, right, so I shall be here regularly. Thank you very much. OK, members, uh, we will move on uh, to agenda item six. Uh, this is the department's uh, budget for 22-25, resource bids. And you'll find that on pages 145 to 213 of the pack. The department has submitted uh, and provided us information that they've submitted to the Department of Finance in relation to the budget 2022-25. This is the second stage in the resource bid process for the forthcoming budget and provides details of the bids for a wide range of issues, including changes to the personal injury discount rate, the COVID recovery, legal aid, PSNI, court service, the prison service, legacy, Gillen and uh, pay pressures. And so the oral evidence session on the department's draft budget for 2022-25 is scheduled for the meeting on the 16th of December, but as we know, is uh, subject to the Department of Finance timetable. So uh, we'll see where that, uh, where that actually goes. Uh, Gemma, you've your hand up. Yeah, thank you, Chair. And these questions might, might wait until the, the oral evidence session, but just in case of two questions, um, £15 million resource Dell bid over three years for from the PIDR. What are the specific costs arising from a change in the PIDR that will fall in the department? I thought that most of those costs would fall on defendants. Um, and the other question is in terms of the, the bid for COVID recovery. Um, how much has been spent by the department so far on the maintenance of Kinnegar as the temporary resting place? And will this need, be needed in the future? Okay, we, we can submit those, yes. Rachel? Thank you. Thank you. I'd also question on the Kinniger, so that, that's good um, for uh, it's covered there. And Chair, I have, I have lots of specific questions that I'll reserve until we get the oral briefing, but I'm wondering if we could request a breakdown of the um, the costs um, that are d described under the other category. Um, I know it's sort of from 10 million up to possible 17 million over the, the three years in terms of the bid. Um, there's bids on setting up the office of a biometrics commissioner. Now, it's my understanding, and I com could be completely wrong, that this is stuff that is stemming from the Gochran judgment, um, or else it's on legacy proposals, and I can't really remember which one, because it was a while since the committee's got an update on those. Um, if it is Gochran, um, as, as far as I understand, that's not being legislated for, and, and legislated for until at least next mandate, if there's a miscellaneous provisions bill in, um, and that's on the retention of, of data and DNA. So I'm just wondering where those costs are coming from. The, the same with the security scheme that might be open up, open, might be opening up to places of worship and other key community buildings. Is this a scheme that's been finalised? You know, is is the department going to give the committee a briefing on this scheme? Is this involving the hate crime review? Um, and then, as well as Project Salas, which is the terrorist-related offender model, um, and that, and we we have had a briefing on that before. But what what's the funding on that? Is that for research? Is that for the modelling? You know, there's just it, not a lot of detail there. And finally, I'd be very interested to know in terms of consultancy costs to the department. How much is the department spending on consultants and for what? Um, so maybe we could ask uh, the department to have specifics in their briefing to that, as well as the breakdown under the um, domestic abuse um, strategy. Um, and we had lots of conversations whenever we were looking at the Domestic Abuse Act about how important it is for that to be fully resourced, but there was no costings along with, with the Act um, whenever we were looking at it. So it is the is the money that is put in there for the next three years, is that five million per annum? Is that new funding? Is that for the implementation of the Act or is that for, for everything else? Um, so aware that there's quite a lot there, Chair, but I'm happy to send that over to, to Christine, should, should that be helpful? Okay, thank you, uh, Rachel. Uh, Sinead? 
Yes, thank you, Chair. And Rachel was quite exhaustive there, so I will go over it. The one other thing I would ask is in the breakdown of that uh, domestic abuse piece, if we could also talk specifically to the legal aid provisions. Um, it has been referred to, but it doesn't give any specific numbers in that regard that I can see. Yep. And commencement dates then, because if we're talking money, we must then be in the realms of having commencement dates in order. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And that brings us in nicely when we've just mentioned legal aid uh, to agenda item seven, uh, the results of the consultation and recommendations of the policy of publishing annual payments to suppliers of legal aid. You'll find that at pages 215 to 275. And the department has provided a written briefing on the paper setting out the outcomes of the consultation, where it sought the views and the opinions of the re-establishment of the policy of the Legal Services Agency of Publishing on an annual basis details of the payment of public uh, funds to those suppliers who deliver services funded by legal aid. Uh, the uh, eight responses were received uh, and there was consensus around the publication of a high level statement indicating the areas of legal aid expenditure, maintaining the principle of publishing details of the payments made to suppliers and the overall approach to determining how many suppliers details should be published there were more varied responses on the approach to applying the test to the balance the legitimate interest against the individual practitioner's interest, rights and freedoms, including whether this balancing test was met. And there was more consensus, however, around the approach uh, to considering individual objections to publication. So on the basis of the response, uh, the response is the minister is content to proceed to develop for the publication of an overall summary of high-level legal aid expenditure for the years 2015-16 to 2019-2020, along with details of payments of the 100 solicitors, firms and barristers in receipt of the highest value of payments and the, brand, the banded summary of the payments uh, to other suppliers grouped by bands of 25,000 below the top 100 of these uh, years. Timelines will be set out for the publication of this information uh, and notes for editors will provide background information on the annual publication and once this has been completed for these years preparation for the publication of the information for 2020-2021 will commence and after that the year's information has been published a further consultation will seek to move from the top 100 to a financial trigger for publication in future years and consider other aspects of the publication process. So uh, just for members to note or whether there's any other uh, comments that we want to make in relation to that matter. Okay, thank you. Brings us to item eight, the Sojourner report and the follow-up and the review of the implementation of the recommendations in the thematic inspection of the handling of domestic violence and abuse cases by the criminal justice system, an update on the progress uh, to the implementation and recommendations written paper. You'll find all that uh, in regards to pages 275 to 298 of today's pack. The Department have provided an update on the progress to implementation and the outstanding recommendations of the Sir Jenny follow-up review and the earlier thematic report. The Department has provided details on the recent progress uh, and the resources allocated to the work, so it's asked members to note the update provided by the department, unless there's any other specific query or question or clarification that we need. Thank you. Item uh, nine is the. Yeah, and is a, the general report and the follow-up review of the implementation of the recommendation in regards to the thematic inspection of the handling of the sexual violence and abuse cases by the criminal justice system. And you'll find that at pages 296 to 306. The department has provided an update on the progress to the delivery of the outstanding recommendations uh, of the, uh, the Sir Jenny follow-up review of the earlier thematic report on the handling of sex and violence and abuse cases by the criminal justice system. They've provided uh, details of the recent developments and the resources allocated uh, to the work. And it's just to ask members do you have any other queries or questions, uh, Rachel? 
Thank you, Chair. And it is just uh, in relation to the part of the research uh, or part of the, the report that is said to be carried out by Professor Thomas, um, but the research has been delayed by the pandemic and work has been temporarily paused in relation to jury directions. Um, and I understand that there's limited opportunity to fully develop this and legislate for this in this mandate, unless, of course, it was something that the committee would want to consider apart from uh, as part of the justice bill. But I'm just wondering if there is any, re um, you know, why is it not being progressed or, or having a temporary stop pause on it uh, in terms of jury directions? Because um, that that's something that I, I, you know, I'm not too sure if it, you know, it could be restarted quickly or, or why. It, why, when, when uh, the department may be bringing that back for, for work to continue on it, because it's a very important piece um, on, on this, the Jenny report. Okay, well, we'll see clarification from the department. Agreed. Good. Agenda item 10 is a consultation and review of the probation board NI status and governance, and you'll find that on pages 308 to 340. And the department has previously informed the committee that it was undertaking a review of the status and the governance of the Probation Board in Northern Ireland. This has been recommended by Sir Jenny in a report on the probation practice in Northern Ireland and forms part of the Department's response to the review of the arms length body required in New Decade New Approach. Having considered a number of options, the Department's view is that there should be no change to the status of the Probation Board, and this preferred option will be set out in the proposed consultation. The Department is, however, proposing to reducing the number of the board members to the chair and between eight to ten members appointed by the Minister of Justice, and to remove the requirement to appoint a deputy chair, given that this post has no specific function. Uh, it is also proposing to rename uh, the, proportion, the uh, Probation Board Northern Ireland to Probation Northern Ireland and to amend the duty to provide an adequate probation service to one that is effective and efficient. The Department intends to hold a target consultation on the proposals to include the Probation Board, the NI Prison Service, the Youth Justice Agency and key and voluntary community bodies that would work closely with the Probation Board in Northern Ireland. It then intends to bring forward the legislation in the next mandate to give effect to any of the agreed changes. The Department has also advised that the, the Probation Board NI Board is due to be reconstituted in March 2022, and the term of the appointment will extend until 2025. This competition will launch, be launched on the 21st of October and is being run under the existing legislation. And it's for members to note, uh, Gemma. Thanks, Chair. And um, yeah, I, I just was wondering about this because the final recommendations are quite significant. Why is it just a targeted consultation? Is there any chance we could ask the department to do a public consultation? Okay, yeah. okay. Uh, Rachel? No, no, okay. Sorry, Chair, yeah, okay. I wasn't not for this one. Oh, okay, all right, thank you. Okay, members, uh, just with that one question that Gemma's raised, we'll, we'll take that back to the department, thank you. Uh, item 11 is the correspondence. There are 10 items of correspondence in pages 343 to 446 uh, of the meeting pack and one item at page 57 and 61 of the table pack. And I'll just draw your attention to one of the items in the meeting pack and then one in the table pack. Uh, item 11.5 uh, at pages 381 to 383 of the meeting pack. It's correspondence from the Chief Inspector of Criminal Justice Inspection in Northern Ireland advising that she's, she now anticipates publishing the report on the review into the operation of care and supervision units in the Northern Ireland Prison Service early in the new year rather than in November uh, of this year as previously indicated. The committee had previously agreed at a meeting on the 11th of November that the potential to hold a joint evidence session with the Committee for Health uh, on the RQIA report of a review of services for vulnerable persons detained in Northern Ireland prison should be explored and noted that the Sergeant report uh, would be relevant to uh, those discussions. The Health Committee clerk has advised that there could be potential to hold a joint evidence session in February 2022 and this time scale may suit given Sir Jenny report will not now be available uh, to January at the earliest. So it's just to again seek uh, members 
uh, views in regard to those arrangements and if that uh, a suitable way it would have been preferable if we'd had the report. However, it seems as though that's now not going to be made available until later. Uh, Rachel. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, it is disappointing, um, but if there's a delay, there's a delay. Um, it would just be good to get the report to have a look. I just want to clarify that, um, and I would raise this a couple of times ago, but um, whatever we do get the report, and in light of the RQIA one as well, and further to the joint meeting with health, is that the committee would still get a, a briefing on um, on these matters and CSUs and the role of the independent monitoring board? Yeah, okay. Okay. Yes, I think that had, you had mentioned that at the previous at that meeting in November. Is that right? Yes. But just to to reiterate that, that's okay. Thank you. The other item uh, that I want to raise is eleven eleven twelve, and that's in pages fifty seven to sixty one of the table pack, and it's a response from the Lady Chief Justice regarding the damages return and investment bill uh, and the periodical payments order. And it's an interesting uh, correspondence from the Lady Chief Justice. So, as part of the committee's deliberations on the bill, it, it uh, was agreed to recommend to the Lady Chief Justice, in her capacity as chair of the Court of the Directory Rules Committee, that the Rules Committee considers adding to those factors that a court is required to take into account when considering whether or not to make the orders and to help to increase uptake on these and to also invite her to consider holding a judicial studies training event uh, around the orders and the challenges in securing the 100 per cent compensation on investing the lump sum. So the Lady Chief Justice has outlined that in the most of the catastrophic injury cases which require approval by the court, the PPO plays an important part in the settlements. She has advised that the, the uh, desirability and the practicality, the desirability and practicality of any changes to the rules, as suggested, would require careful consideration, not least because of the Damages Act applies UK-wide, and presently the Court of the Judiciary Rules and the equivalent England and Wales provisions contain the same list of specified factors and operate in the same manner too, as far as is possible. They ensure consistency of approach in the three jurisdictions. She also notes that judges also specifically consider the 100 per cent compensation principle, and therefore she is not minded to seek an amendment to the court rules at this time. Sinead. Thank you, Chair. Chair Justice, I welcome this because the PPO. Um, the situation did come up um, quite often during our deliberations on this bill, and it was evidence that if a claimant was to go down that PPO route, that the um, the, the damages return investment rate would not be applicable. But we did find that there seemed to be a real weakness in the system, and we were particularly mindful of those people who would be vulnerable, perhaps vulnerable individuals who needed to ensure that any award given to them would last their natural lifetime. And there, it, it's something that just wasn't pinned down properly um, within the damages return investment bill because it was looking specifically at the percentage rate and the framework of developing that. But it did look away from, in my view, very often the actual victim. And, and I did try as best I could and others did to really focus on the victim and their long-term well-being. And I think this is a welcome thing um, if there is some consistency of approach and absolute transparency um, in terms of those who are advising victims or their, their representative that this option is on the table and that they fully understand it before they go down uh, the route of perhaps, you know, going on a settlement that does involve the discount rate. So I genuinely welcome this. And I know it is um, quite, I suppose, a, a specialised area, but I think it's an important one because these cases are really horrific. So I just want to put on record my thanks. No, thank I'm, you. No, thank you. And, and I think it's good. And I think it, it again highlights the work of this committee, I think, and committee generally, that there was, we now have... Uh, as a public record, 
the comments that the Chief Justice has made in relation to this, and also just that uh, she also indicated that the PPOs are confined to the High Court and more specifically the Queen's Bench Division in almost every case, and she's therefore confident that the judges dealing with these cases have the wealth of experience and knowledge with the issues surrounding the personal injury discount rate and the legislation case law practice and procedures relevant to making the PPO. So I think that that's good that we have that on record and uh, it is appreciated, the correspondence that we've received from the Lady Chief Justice. So thank you. And thank you to those members, uh, Sinead and others, who certainly have pursued this issue. So thank you very much. Item uh, 12, the chairperson's business, will remain the chairperson's business, because there is none. Is there, is there, is there is one. Not what it says here. Yeah. Yeah. So before we go to chairs, Mrs. Yes. Can I just check, is the committee content to action the rest of the Oh, yes. Board? Apologies. Are you content to action the rest? Yeah. Okay. okay. Sinead, you have a question? Or is that maybe just not up from the, pre the hand up from the previous? Ah, thank you. Apologies. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Well, I thought there was no chair versus business, but there is. <laughs> There's one item, and that is a request from the PSNI to host an event in the Lone Gallery. The PSNI is currently developing a strategy to tackle violence and intimidation against women and girls, and it plans to discuss the draft strategy with a range of key stakeholders at an event on Wednesday, the 12th of January, 2022, uh, and. The head of the Public Protection Branch, Detective Chief Superintendent Anthony McNally, has asked if the committee would host the event in the Lone Gallery, given the members' interests in the issue, and it's just to seek the agreement of members for the committee to host the event on the 12th of January in 2022 in the Lone Gallery. Agreed. Gemma? Yeah, agreed, Chair, no problem. Just wondering, uh, is this just for committee members, or can staff attend as well? We'll check the arrangements. Yeah, I we'll think the PS and I will do most of the arranging, but we'll we'll yeah. have a word with them and say, and we'll let you know. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Item uh, agenda item thirteen. Any other business? Okay. And then ag agenda item fourteen is the date and time and place of the next meeting. The meeting for the Department of the or the Committee of Justice will take place on Thursday, the 9th uh, of. December at 2 p.m. in room 30. I went to room 30 earlier on, and it was here, so I'll get to room 30 next week. All right. So and I thank you all for your help again in uh, getting through today's agenda, and thank you very much for your attendance. Thank you. Thank you. Assembly Senate Chamber Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Program Signed.